Exodus chapter 32. I'm going to look at verses 1 through 14 uh, this morning. It says, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we did, do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down for your people uh, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent that he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember, Abraham, Isaac and Israel, Jacob, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of, heavens, of heaven and all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Uh, the OJs, not the Blue Jays, but the OJs sang this song back in, I think it was the 70s. You got to give the people what they want. You got to give the people what they want. And they were singing about truth and justice and civil rights, and they were right on for singing that. If you're in a, a business or, say, if you got a restaurant, uh, you're not going to do too well unless you give people something that is appetizing to them. I was watching this program last night where a guy goes in, it's on the Food Network, I believe, he goes in and he helps restaurants uh, to get their business regenerated and get it going again. And he gives them instructions and advice. And one of the things he was doing was helping them to change their menu, to make it more appetizing and to draw in more business. So sometimes, yeah, you've got to give people what they want. But Exodus 32, the story we just read, it lets us know that sometimes that's not a good idea. Sometimes it's not a good idea to give people what they want. People, after Moses had been up on the mountain for so long and gone so long and so many days, they became impatient. They became impatient. Ever told you that God is not a fast food God? You've got to have patience when you're in relationship with the God of Scripture. So, but the people became impatient, and they became so impatient that even though they had said on two different occasions, after God had spoken all of His Ten Commandments to the people, 
And the first time he, when he spoke, he scared the daylights out of them. So they remembered. They remembered what he had said. And even though they heard the word of God, the commandments of God, and had agreed to keep those commandments and to do all that the Lord had spoken, they demanded that Aaron make for them an idol. An idol that they would bow down to and worship even though God had forbid them and commanded them not to. And what did Aaron do? He had an opportunity. He could have said, you know, remember what God said? Remember what God's Word said? But instead, he gave the people what they wanted. And it led to disaster. God was living. He was ready to wipe them out and start all over again with Moses. But Moses interceded on behalf of the people. Moses began to pray on behalf of the people and for the sake of the people. And he appealed to God's goodness. He appealed to God's character. He appealed to God's mercy. And he reminded God of a promise that he had made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, the storyline is in the what? The family line. And God relented of the disaster that He had planned for the people. In this story, we see that God will respond to intercessory prayer, and God, as Moses prays, prays He is eliciting the very nature and character of God to be compassionate and merciful, even in the face of flat-out rebellion and apostasy. So God is gracious and God is merciful and He, he relents of the disaster that He had planned. Now Moses, who had fixed his eyes on God for almost 40 days here, he had fixed his eyes on God and he had been listening intently to the Word of God. He comes down the mountain with these, gold, these tablets, not golden tablets, but these stone tablets. And he sees what the people are doing and worshiping and bowing down to this golden calf that they had made, this young bull that they had made. He saw what they were doing and the revelry that was taking place. And it, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it sounds like they were having, along with the worship and the sacrifices, they were having a drunken orgy. Okay? That's what was going on. I hope, I hate that you, I hope you don't have to explain that word to your kids later today. Don't worry, just forget about that. So that's what was going on. They were getting wild. They were having a party. Okay? And they were getting into all kinds of stuff. Their idolatry had to lead them as a gateway into further and further rebellion and apostasy against, apostasy against God. Rebellion against God. And when Moses saw what he was doing, even though he had already prayed and asked God to repent, to relent of the, uh, the plan that God had to destroy the people, Moses burned with anger himself when he saw what they were doing. He burned with anger and he smashed those tablets of stone. Now what that meant was that he was signifying that the covenant was now <clears throat> broken. The covenant God had made and the covenant that the people had agreed to was broken. Now God would later renew that covenant. And God would indeed forgive and He would be merciful and compassionate. And God does forgive people. Always has, always will. But in this life, sometimes even when we're forgiven, there will still be consequences. And there were dire consequences in this case, and there are consequences that went on with them uh, later on as they continued to travel through the wilderness. God had forbidden them, God had forbidden them about making idols. God had forbidden them from making idols. So sometimes it's good to give people what they want. Sometimes it is. And you've got to make it appetizing. I think about, you know, has anybody ever been to Mount Airy, North Carolina? They have an autumn leaves festival every year. And I remember going there. One of the longest lines at this autumn leaves festival was for a little booth that was selling collard green sandwiches. Has anybody ever had a collard green 
sandwich. Now, I know it's, it's kind of dangerous for a preacher right before a big meal like this to start talking about food, but I'm probably safe with a collard green sandwich because it doesn't sound too appetizing, does it? But apparently uh, it's made with cornbread and collard greens and some bacon. Now, you know, bacon can do wonders for just about anything. <laughs> So I'm not sure if it was a bacon. I never had one. I don't know what it was. But the longest line I saw at this whole thing was for this booth selling collard green sandwiches. So there was something about it. Maybe sometimes, you know, sometimes novelty sells. Sometimes something that just sounds so crazy, people just got to go try it, right? You know, so maybe that's what was going on. I, I don't think it became as popular as anybody ever been to Snappy Lunch up there. Now, sat snappy lunch, they sell a heart attack on a bun. Fried pork chop, fried in lard with a, a slice of tomato, and I think it's slaw and onions and uh, mustard and chili on this uh, pork chop sandwich there in Mount Airy, North Carolina. That's probably a lot more popular than that collard green sandwich, but the collard green sandwich was pretty popular. So sometimes, if you're going to be successful, you got to give people what they want, but there's a danger. There's a danger in Sometimes it's not wise to give people what they want because the people here demanded idols and direct disobedience of God's commandment and it led to disaster. So why is it that God forbids idols? What's the big deal about idols? Well, number one, an idol is something that is far, far less than God. An idol is always something where people try to represent God and harness the power of God in something that they can control. Idolatry at its heart is a problem with the heart of humanity. It's an exchange of the God who is, a rejection of the God who is who He is for the gods we wish we could have for ourselves. Idolatry, when people would make these idols that they would bow down and worship in the, the uh, ancient world, they knew that they felt like they could harness the powers of the heavens, the limited powers of the heavens, maybe the power of the rains, if you will, or the power of fertility, if you will, or the power to bring luck and fortune to themselves. And there would be powers, dark powers, that would associate themselves with these idols. And the people felt like if they could have an idol, they could begin to manipulate and control the forces in the universe. So the idols are a rejection of the God who is for the gods we wish there was, that we could control, not the God who controls us. The problem with idolatry is a problem of trying to fashion gods in our own image and after our own likeness and our likes rather than accepting the fact that we are created in the image of God not to bend the heaven's will to ours, but for God to bend our will to His. Idolatry is always designed to bend the will of the heavens to our own. But God created us and He fashioned us after His likeness and in His image to do His will and to live according to His Word, not our own. Idolatry always leads to a distortion. To a distortion. And it's, uh, idolatry is anything that we put our hope and our trust in above the one true God. Anything and everything that we can put our trust in above the one true God and the power of the one true God. You know, a lot of times you'll have conversations in, in the church and we'll talk about how we got to make the church relevant, right? And we've got to make the Bible relevant to people. And there's truth in that if we're talking about making it understandable, making it plain, uh, helping people to be able to see the truth of God's Word and understand the truth of God's Word and submit themselves to the truth of God's Word. But there's also a danger in that because <laughs> we can be tempted to just begin to give people what they want so that we can be successful. There's a danger in it. Idolatry always begins a lot of times with good intentions. 
Good, you know, the road to, you know, where's paid with love. Good intentions, right? So idolatry often begins with good intentions, and we end up bowing down and worshiping something that's less than God and that is a distortion of God's Word. One of the ways you can uh, detect idolatry in your own life and in the life of, the, of a church and the life of people is how does the, the thing that they're putting their hope and trust in lead them to treat God's Word? Idolatry always leads to a distortion of God's Word. After Aaron gave the people what they wanted, they said, make us gods. And that's what they meant. Make us gods, basically, that we can bow down to and worship. And then Aaron went ahead and did it, but then he tried to justify it, it sounds like, and rationalize it by calling the idol the Lord. Sometimes people call their idols by the name of the true God, the name of the Lord, the name of Jesus a lot of times. They form and they fashion these idols after their own likes and their own tastes and their own desires to do their own will, and it leads them to distort God's Word. Aaron's calling this idol the Lord, but it's the same Lord who said, do not make what? Idols. <coughs> It's a distortion. I was at a conference, I mentioned this last week, I believe, at Myrtle Beach a couple weeks ago. Uh, and uh, at this conference, one of the speakers began to talk about the story of Adam and Eve. And there's a lot of crazy things. But one of the things that she was saying was that Adam and Eve were really just children, young, young children. And that the story was really a story about child abuse. That they were abused by the serpent. Okay? And it wasn't really a story about sin, okay? Uh, the problem with that, the problem with that is this, okay? There's a lot that's said in that story that doesn't fit that narrative that she was trying to spin, okay? We see in the story God gave a commandment. We see in the story that Adam and Eve, after the temptation of the serpent, disobeyed the commandment, right? And they, along with the serpent, suffered consequences and were punished and were exiled from the garden. Now this mirrors the pattern that we'll see uh, happen with Israel. Israel's going to be given commandments. We've seen the Ten Commandments. And they're going to be promised. If you'll keep them, you'll be what? Blessed. If you disobey them, you will be cursed. And of course, the history leads to us to sh shows us that they did not keep the commandments, and therefore they were expelled or exiled from what? The promised land, right? So to say that Genesis 1 through 3 has nothing to do with sin is crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So what would lead a person, what would lead a person to that kind of interpretation of Scripture? One guess. An idol. An idol. This speaker had this vision of God. Her image of God was a God who's kind of like a huge cosmic non-judgmental therapist who would never punish anybody for something like sin. Her idol led her to distort the Word of God. Idolatry leads us into falsehood because idols are not God. Idols are not true. Idols are a lie in and of themselves, and they lead us into falsehood. So there's all kinds of danger in idolatry, and sometimes the danger can be very subtle, and it can start out with very good intentions, but we've got to be careful. Our vision of God and the God that we will worship will determine our destiny and who we become and what we become like. Now, a lot of times we think, well, we don't worship idols like those uh, primitive pagan uh, people <coughs> in the ancient world. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Seth. Uh, maybe we do. Maybe we haven't seen anybody make a golden calf and bow down to it. I'm not sure if you've ever seen anybody bowing down to this bull on Wall Street. But a lot of people put their hopes and their dreams and, and their faith in the success and the sufficiency that Wall, Wall Street can bring them, right? Above the one true God. We begin to worship the Almighty God rather than trusting in the God whom our, our dollars tell us 
the drugs, right? So sometimes we have idols and we don't even recognize it in our own society. Anything or any image that we kind of aspire to, to become like, to find success in can become an idol. Political figures can become an idol. Other people can become an idol. I know a lot of times uh, one of the problems that happens in, in relationships is uh, people expect too much from other people, especially in marriages a lot of times. People expect too much from another person. They expect another person to be their be-all, their end-all, to make them completely and totally happy. And when that person fails to do that, as they inevitably will, people can begin to get angry with them. For not making me happy. You're not making me happy. Okay? But it's truly only the one true God who can ultimately make us happy. When I was in Kenya and we were uh, with one of the schools there, United you know, Methodist Schools in Kenya, one of the, the groups of kids, one of the middle school groups, they, they said, Pastor, who do you like better, Trump or Obama? Like, wow, what a question. <laughs> so <laughs> so they, they kind of hear about what's going on from the media, God help them, uh, from our country, right? But I just happen to have my t-shirt on that I, I wear sometimes. It's got all the superheroes, you know, Superman, Spider-Man, Incredible Hulk, all those uh, comic book superheroes. But it's got Jesus right in the middle of them. And Jesus is talking to them and telling them about how he actually saved the world. Because he is the true superhero. So what I did is I pointed to my shirt and said, you know, the Bible warns us, Psalm 146, 3 through 6, it warns us not to put our trust in princes or in rulers or in people in whom their breath is going to, when they die, they're gone. Right? They're gone. Not to put our hope and our trust above everything and anything in people or leaders. Now, sometimes we choose our idols. Sometimes people willingly choose to worship maybe a political figure. We'll make statues of them, won't we? We'll have pictures of them. Right? We'll even have t-shirts of them with their face and a, a, a really attractive looking leg, right? But I told the kids, put your trust in Jesus. Allow Him to be your Lord and Savior above all. And I, you know, it doesn't mean you can't support political candidates or whatever, but don't put all of your hope and trust in a political leader. So sometimes people willingly choose idols in their lives. And other times, idols are forced upon us by the culture. In China, recently in China, the government went into churches in China and replaced the image of Jesus Christ with the image of their communist president. Now that's happened in different ways throughout history, but this kind of thing goes on all <coughs> over the world. Remember the story of Daniel? If you can go to the next slide there. Remember the story of Daniel? Uh, the king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, built this huge statue of himself, this huge idol, and he demanded that people bow down to this idol, right? You see those three dudes? I love those three dudes. Don't be like everybody else. Don't just go with the flow. Don't just follow the crowd. We have to resist idolatry. The idolatry that stirred in our own human heart that's tempted, where we're tempted from within, or the idolatry that the culture tries to force upon us to make us bow down to its idols. The thing about idols is the dark powers associated with these idols are harsh, harsh taskmasters. A lot of times, they'll first, they'll promise freedom and they'll promise enlightenment, but they eventually and inevitably will engulf their devotees in absolute darkness <coughs> and slavery. Yes. And idol worshipers, are, they, they, they're not content with their own worship of their idols. They want to try to force that idol worship on others. And this is what you see here. Let's be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and resist the idols that come from within or that are tried to be tried to be forced upon us from without. John Calvin said the human heart is an idol factory. And we have to resist the temptation to idolatry. To put anything above the one true God. 
Now again, these idols, a lot of times in the dark powers associated, they promise freedom, they promise enlightenment, but they end up in slavery. It reminds me of the story of the, the devil invited this man to come and tour hell. Uh, he's like trying to convince this guy, you know, hell's not that bad. Why don't you come and vacation with us for a while? It'll be great. You'll see how great it is and you'll love it. So the man took him up on his uh, offer and he ended up going to hell and uh, spending a good time there. And it's like a great vacation at a wonderful resort beyond your wildest imagination. So the guy determined, you know, hell is not as bad as people have made it out to be. I think that's where the part, I've heard people say this, by the way, that's where the real parties are going to be. And that's where I want to go. So the man dies and he ends up in hell. And it's absolutely horrific. Horrific. Beyond his wildest nightmares, his most incredible nightmares. It was that horrific. And he says to the devil, but you said it was going to be great. And the devil said, well, that's when you were only a tourist. But now you're a permanent resident. Sometimes these idols promise pleasure, but it's only temporary. And what you end up with is an eternity of pain. These idols can captivate us. And it all can come from a simple desire to have the God that we want rather than the God that we really need. The God who really is who He is rather than the gods we wish there were. The real thing is so much better. The real thing, God, the God of the Bible will never satisfy our sinful flesh, but He will save our eternal souls. And that's what really matters. That's what really matters. Idols are false, and they lead us into falsehood, into distortion. 1 John, I'll close with this. 1 John chapter 5, verses 19-21, through 21, it says... We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ, He is the true God and eternal life. And it ends with this. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. If we'll keep ourselves from idols, God will keep and guard our hearts. And He will reveal to us His will and lead us into the light of truth. <laughs> if we will keep ourselves from idols, God will keep us from the devices of the evil one. Amen? Amen. Amen. Please stand as you're able as we close today. Our altar here is always open. If you'd like to come and pray for anything, please come and pray.